Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so good afternoon, everyone. Everyone's like, okay, forget it, we're eating. Let me try it again. Good afternoon, everyone. Good, good afternoon. afternoon. All right. I feel like a teacher if you move this podium because that's like real handy as far as I like doing that and moving stuff around. But to give a brief introduction about me, my name is Bertie Kelso. I'm the owner of Integral. Uh, we're a tech support, tech services company based out of uh, Kansas City. Uh, for the past 26 years, we've been going around helping people like yourselves, homes and businesses with all of their computer and IT needs. We do Windows, we do Mac, we do smartphones, we do tablets, we do networks, all that wonderful stuff that Joe and Geek Squad and all the other IT guys you know do, that's what we do. Um, as far as myself, <laughs> I'm uh, fortunate enough to be featured on all of the local stations in the metro area. Uh, as a matter of fact, after I leave here, I gotta run the 41. Action News to do an interview about, I guess, Ring Doorbell got hacked or something like that. So, <laughs> but basically it works. If the news calls, the 41 calls, or Fox 4 calls, Channel 5, or uh, what am I missing, Channel 9, yeah. if they call, I go running down there to uh, be their guest tech expert. So I've been on all of the shows here in the metro area. I've been to St. Louis on TV, on uh, Great Day St. Louis, on, and, um, oh, it's Great Day, I'm trying to think of the other one. Oh, Show Me St. Louis. I've been up on St. Joe, on, um, there, these stations are gonna kill me. I'm like, <laughs> but anyway, I've been to Ozarks, I've been to St. Joe, I've been to uh, Kansas and Wichita. So I'm all over. So um, my goal as far as technology and people is to make sure that everyone has a good comprehension of how technology works in their home and their business because technology can be complicated. And I wanna be the tech guy that's able to talk to people in everyday terms to make sure that they get the most out of the technology that they use, which leads me to the six cybersecurity uh, tech resolutions that everyone should be doing in 2020 and how to get them. So I don't even know how to operate a clicker. First, I need to turn it on, right? All right, now it's on. So let's go. So just turn out what your resolutions for next year. And hey, you can't cheat and say, yeah, I'm gonna get more cyber secure. Leave that out. So what are your resolutions for this coming year? Anyone, just shout out. Go to yoga class. Go to yoga class, all right. I'm going to take time off from teaching yoga class. That's right. Yeah. What else? You're going to try to cut back on the pizza. Try to, well, Save, you better get as many slices as you weight. can today. That's right, yeah. I need to do that as well. I need to lose some weight. Anyone else? So that was, last time I did this uh, discussion with a group of people, everyone was saying make more money. So I guess I was with a bunch of greedy folks. They were like, I want to make more money. Anyone else as far as tech resolutions? Or just resolutions, period? Yes. Cut the budget. Cut the budget. Spend less. Spend less, yes. Anyone else? Well, I believe it or not, I want to lose some weight. I want to be like, you know, <laughs> one of those guys. Not like auto big, but you know, I want to be. But the thing that, and I told you guys not to say it, but the thing that most people don't make resolutions on is what they're gonna do with their technology. And especially with cybersecurity, which is very, very, very important. Because one of the last things people want to see come up on their devices or to realize is that you've been hacked. You've been hacked. No one's, I always say, show of hands who's been hacked. Some people admit it. Oh, Joe, come on now, you're an IT guy. You can't be saying you've been hacked. Yeah. Well, don't call that guy. <laughs> I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been, you put yourself out there. You, you can't be saying that. I've been targeted. Oh, have you? Well, of course we've all been targeted, but followed for it. Yeah, it's a bigger deal. So that's the last thing we want to deal with. But the challenge <coughs> in today's world is there are so many things <coughs> going on out there. Like, like I said, I'm going down to 41 Action News to talk about uh, Ring Doorbell. I guess they got hacked or something. But, I mean, you have to understand what a hack is versus what isn't a hack. So there, I guess your data gets out there a lot of different ways. Number one, you've got large scale data breaches where your information's just thrown out there and it's out in the wild. Another one requires user interaction, meaning that you actually click on something and you invite the hackers in, which brings up to resolution number one. Stop allowing criminals to access your data. And that's what happens when you hear about these large data breaches that go on, like some hospital got a, infected with ransomware. I think Truman Medical Center got infected with ransomware this year. And everyone, I hope at this point, understands what ransomware is, right? No? 
So ransomware is where I password protect your computer so you can't get access to your files and then I demand that you pay me in order for you to, uh, to get, gain access to it. And I do it in such a way that uh, there isn't really any technology that can uh, uh, fix the problem. So if you call a tech guy and say, hey, I got this message, Joe wants me to pay him a bunch of money in Bitcoin. Uh, they're not going to be able to help you once it happens. The only way you can really do anything is to prevent your files from being uh, encrypted in the first place or make sure you have good backups so that you can restore when that happens. So yes, ransomware is one of the most deadliest threats out there because basically your file is taken ransom. They're destroyed, to put it mildly, and there's no way to get, get it back. But most of the ransomware cases that you hear about in the news, like with uh, Pitney Bowes, with... Um, Truman Medical Center, uh, some of the municipalities around the country, which are huge targets, it's because some employee clicked on something that they weren't supposed to. It's not, I mean, you have to understand that there are threats running around the internet, like bots and programs that are designed and always knocking on the door of your devices, your computers, whatever, trying to get into any holes or exploits in your devices. But if you look at all of the large scale data breaches that have occurred as far as ransomware is concerned, it's because some employee got curious about that UPS package that they were waiting on or that Amazon order that they were waiting on, especially around the holidays to say, oh, that package is running late. Oh my gosh, I don't want that to happen. What am I gonna do? So they click on it. And so they, then, they open the door and then the ransomware gets in. The <coughs> ransomware is so deadly, not only does it infect your individual computer or device, it'll go across your entire network and just lay waste all your precious files and photos and whatever else you've got stored on your individual computer and on your servers. But it's user for them. Now again, like I said, you've got large scale data breaches, meaning that companies like, I'm trying to think of someone, Equifax is one that comes to mind, Target, um, I'm trying to think of someone. Throw some out. Who's been Children's breached? Mercy. So they had, they had Mercy. Children's Mercy also had a data breach. Really? Got, oh, really? You're just like out them? Because I didn't read about that. Yeah. Oh, no, I saw that. Yeah. We got some in the mail. Oh, really? Oh, wow. We were a part of it. Oh, really? See, I didn't know about that. Well, anyway, data breaches occur when large companies are attacked by them because they know they have either important data where they can get money or they've got uh, important information like social security numbers and even your addresses and phone numbers. So you have large scale data breaches that occur and that means that when that data breach occurs, they release that information out in the wild or on the dark web and then other hackers buy that information in order to get access to your individual or your company information. But like I said, the other way that your information is gonna get breached is by you clicking on something and open the door for the, for the love of God. Quit clicking on those emails that come through and quit being curious about that stuff because Chances are, if your information has been leaked in a breach, it's because of something that you did. Like I said earlier, all your devices have all the security protocols in place. As long as you keep up to date and use current stuff, that's gonna keep hackers from getting your information. Keep that in mind. So if you don't click on anything, and then you make sure that if your information is part of a large data breach, you go and change the passwords for all of your online accounts, you're gonna stay safe. One of the other ways hackers get your information too is from robocalls. I mean, I let my calls go to voicemail for a reason. Because if I don't recognize a number, voicemail's there for my convenience. So quit being curious and saying, oh, golly, I wonder who that is. <laughs> and don't answer the phone. One of the other better ways if you own, have small businesses, or <coughs> businesses that are mobile, Use a voice over IP service to answer and to make phone calls from your smartphone. You do not want to give out your cellular data. Never, 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 never. Am I right, Joe? That's right. He's right, yeah. Of course he's angry. Yeah. But no, but I'm not. You, you don't, because hackers will use that information, meaning your cell phone numbers, to call you or to call other people. And what will happen is, is your business will get a bad reputation and people will begin to block your number. And your number may even show up on the do not call list. One of the best examples I can think of that is, uh, remember a couple years ago, 
where the guy had a tow truck service in Texas. And somehow he sent that tow truck to be demolished, but it didn't get demolished. It got shipped overseas. And so the Taliban was driving around with this guy's number and his tow truck company doing horrible acts. So of course the guy, um, I guess he ended up going out of business because you know the, the demo company didn't destroy his pro truck, tow truck like they were supposed to. So, I mean, it's, it's the same thing. You don't want to be put in that scenario when it comes to your cell phone number. So always find a way to use, use a number other than your cell phone number to make outgoing calls so that you don't fall victim to, um, you don't fall victim to having a bad reputation for your number. One of the other things too, you have to look at this interesting fact up here. 81% of hacking related breaches leverage using stolen or weak passwords. It's another way you let hackers in by using same passwords for all of your online accounts or just using weak passwords. I know it's a pain in the butt. I know it's a pain in the butt, but you've got to use strong passwords for all of your online accounts. And number two on this list is actually <coughs> passwords. But one thing you want to do as far as your business is concerned and for yourselves individually is to make sure that your information is not floating out there on the web. And there's two websites that will allow you to do this. Number one is one of my favorites, Have I Been Owned? Dot com. I want to take a photo of that because you want to find out if you've been pwned or not. In fact, you can do it right now. What is what, what is what? What does that mean, pwned? Well, I'm going to take this one, Joe. Go ahead. All right. So, pwned is a misspelling of owned, and it's used in the video game world. One time, a gamer like demolished somebody in a video game, and he's trying to hurry up and type, you've been owned. We goofed up and hit P instead of uh, O, and the new catchphrase is you've been told. So now gamers will put that when they defeat somebody on a video game. So that's where the verbiage comes from. But anyway, if you visit haveibeenpwned.com, you can put in your email address to find out if your email has been part of a large scale data breach. And once you put that email address in that website and hit have I been pwned, it'll let you know if you've been pwned or if you haven't been pwned. If you've been pwned, it'll let you know what, e what which of your email addresses have been part of whatever data breach. And if you've been pwned, you want to go through and take the steps of changing your password for any online account that you use with that email address. Because hackers utilize passwords that they get off the dark web. Anyone seen if they've been pwned? I did. Uh -oh. I Joe, why are you raising your hand? I, I bet been a part of the data breach. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, all my passwords are unique to each site. Oh, okay. Keep that down. So, yeah, how many, how many, how many times have someone been phoned? Four. Four. Three. At least twice. Twice. Fourteen. What? Joe's out I've been a part of a lot of data breaches. I see that your email getting out there. Popular guy. Anyone else care to say how many times they've been phoned? Well, this is an email I don't use anymore other than for junk, and it's been uh, breached twice by 12 sites. Wow. You get an extra slice of pizza. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't use it anymore, so if somebody asks me for an email that I really don't want to get in, I give this one. So, so the challenge is, is people, especially like Tina saying, oh, if you have an email address that you don't use anymore, you have to remember what password did I use with that email address. So if you're using the same password for that email that you don't use anymore for like active email, you got a problem. So you want to go through and change all of your passwords for your online accounts to make sure that hackers aren't utilizing your information. Now, the way that hackers take advantage of that is a process called credentialing or credential stuffing. Stuffing. I get it right. I think I got a slide for that. But anyway, what happens with credential stuffing is that hackers will use your email address and your passwords for old accounts to try to log in a new one. And once they do that and get access to your accounts, they can sell your accounts online on the dark web for free or for a small fee. And then people can start using your online account. Now that may not be a big deal because this happened with Disney Plus as far as a, a lot of accounts suffered credential stuffing. But if you lose access to your Disney Plus account or your Netflix accounts, it may not be a big deal. Now, if those passwords that you're using for your online streaming accounts are the same passwords that you're using for financial accounts, it becomes a big issue. So that's why you want to make sure that you're using different passwords for all of your online accounts. 
Another website that you can go to is called fightingidentitycrimes.com. Now, Fighting Identity Crimes is a website that will let you know every company that's been part of a data breach since 2012. And the importance of that is, it's like the two ladies up here mentioned about Children's Mercy and that their information was in a data breach. Now, there's a lot of companies that aren't so forthcoming when it comes to them being breached or not. So Fighting Identity Crimes keeps track of all of those breaches so that you can go in and research for yourself to make sure that companies that you are dealing with have not become victims of data breaches. Because I mean, they're supposed to tell you when they've been breached, but a lot of times they don't come forward. So then your information's out there and you're wondering, well, golly, how did my email and password get out there? How did I become a victim? Well, Fighting Identity Crimes will let you know. And the website is so thorough that if you visit it, not only will it show breaches from 2012 up to like this month, but it'll also tell you what information was leaked in the breach and what steps you should take in order to protect yourself. Sometimes like the Disney Plus hack, it's just credential stuffing where they were using old usernames and passwords to log into the account. Other times it's severe enough where social security numbers were leaked in a data breach and you need to get like uh, identity theft protection services. And I know a lot of people have that happen with the Equifax data breach. So this is a good resource to make sure that your information is not floating out there because unfortunately in these times, you do have to take steps to make sure that your information is safe because it's not always gonna wind up on the nightly news if a bunch of information was breached out there. Uh, there's a picture of a turkey. But that was my representation of credential stuffing. <laughs> Funny, right? I thought it was a good looking turkey, but then I saw the stuffing and I'm like, that's a good example. But that's gonna probably be one of the more prevalent crimes in 2020 is hackers getting old account information because most of you probably aren't gonna, even after this, aren't gonna go and change all your passwords. So hackers can get on the dark web and use your old credentials to log into online accounts. So don't be a turkey, right? Don't get stuffed. <laughs> Uh, another next thing we need to talk about is identity protection. If you find out that you've been part of a data breach and your social security numbers have been leaked, then yes, you probably do need to sign up for some type of identity protection service. And don't ask me which one's the best, because I know that question's coming. I don't know. Joe, you got any recommendations? Nope. Me? I don't either. <coughs> so LifeLock obviously is a big one, but I think they suffered a data breach. I know there's ID Shield. Um, the same people who sell, uh, what's that? Used to be prepaid legal, legal shield, I think is what it's called now. They have like identity protection services. But regardless, it's a good idea to have some type of identity protection. If you don't want to sign up for an identity protection service, you can always sign up for the free credit monitoring. Well, not that, but you can sign up for free services that will alert you when there's been changes to your credit. Like Credit Karma is an excellent app to use. It came in handy. I want you to go get a new store, a new phone at the Verizon store. And it kind of pissed me off because the salesperson was just going through and setting them up the account. And then they ran a credit check on me, which they did not say that they were gonna do. Because I probably would have stayed in with old Raggedy Sprint if I had it known <laughs> that they were gonna do a credit check. I think the salesperson should have been forthcoming and said, hey, would you mind if we want a credit check? Because obviously that affects your credit score. But credit karma is good. A lot of credit card companies offer the credit score service where it alerts you if there has been alerts. But I think Credit Karma is probably one of the best ones to use. You also want to get into the habit of checking your credit score quarterly for yourself and for your business. Now for your individuals, you can do the all three, Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. Thank you, yeah, I always don't want to say them because of the obvious, but I can't believe they're still in business. <laughs> but they are. Now for a business, you can only do TransUnion, and Experian. I don't think Equifax does business credit scores. But you want to check those on a regular basis just to make sure that you haven't had any dings or no one's bought a brand new car like on the Price is Right with uh, your line of credit. So make sure you got those services enabled. You can also um, uh, you can also have your credit locked through all three organs. Oh, you're getting there. Sorry. Where are you? No, no, I'll let you do it. I'll only interrupt. Oh, no, no, that's all right. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the other thing. <laughs> your credit locked. Good thing I have that out there. But yeah, if you have everything that you've ever wanted, 
then having your credit locked is probably one of the best things to do. So what does that do? But with that, I will say, with that, if you are in the process of purchasing a home or a vehicle, or you are getting ready to take a trip, that can be your worst nightmare because you may go somewhere and you're trying to purchase something, not in your local state or wherever, and you have to call all three of the credit bureaus to get that lock taken back off. And then it's not easy. Well, that's kind of good news. Oh, well, sorry. <laughs> hey, I'm like you. I, I just jump I right in. I know. Right. I'm going to stop you, but you were just going to number two. Improve your password protection. Everyone hates <laughs> passwords, but my recommendation is to use passphrases as your password. Passphrases are basically two words put together, like stinky chicken, or old turkey, or I can't, don't use brown squirrel, because it's kind of obvious, right? <laughs> Yellow squirrel, you can't even use black squirrel. You know why? Because Marysville, Kansas, where my wife is from, is home to the black squirrel. So, just to let you know that. So don't use black squirrel, because it's a such animal as a black squirrel. But anyway, passphrases are a lot easier for you to remember. You can come up with two words, song lyrics, whatever, as a passphrase with some numbers, and it always will fit the criteria that is used to create secure passwords for your online accounts. But the challenge is, is that you have to use multiple passphrases for all of your online accounts. So that's where a nice password manager comes into play. Joe's got, I get the thumbs up from Joe. Let's keep doing Two something. thumbs up. Two thumbs up. He may not agree with my choice as a password manager, but I'm gonna throw them out anyway. So my number one choice would be LastPass, which is, oh, two thumbs up from Joe, which is a pass, oh, from the audience. <laughs> Wait till I throw out the other one that I'm gonna recommend to you. So LastPass is an app that you can download from all of your devices. It allows you to keep all of your different passwords or passphrases for all of your online accounts. So that way, if you're gonna to go to the bank, or on Facebook, or Twitter, whatever, LastPass will automatically log you in on whatever device that you have LastPass logged into. And everyone, someone's gonna ask. No one's gonna ask. So I'll, I'll ask. So Burton, what happens if someone gets into your LastPass password? Well, obviously, they're gonna get access to your password, right? So the key is with LastPass, you gotta use a secure password. It's that simple. And LastPass is good enough that it'll generate a nice, hard to remember password for you to use, or you can just use a good old password. Now, if you don't want to use LastPass, you can also use your browser to store your password. Not saying it's secure, but at least having multiple passwords for your online accounts is better than using the same password for all of your online accounts. What do you mean by browser? Chrome, Safari, oh, Firefox. Oh, you're saving it in that. Okay, yeah. But it's going to be just on your device and it's not logged out and you can't get it back in whatever you do with it. Yeah, exactly. They get onto your device. Same thing with LastPass. Someone gets onto your device. But if it lets you set a different password for each site, it's much more likely that one of those sites will get hacked and they're going to get in and get that browser uh, password file that has all your stuff in it. Right, exactly. Yeah, because you've got to... Um, because someone has to have a hold of your device in order to get access to all those different passwords. But for a lot of people, it's a lot easier rather than trying to figure out how to download LastPass is to get on your browser and to figure out, you know, your browser will pop up like Edge, uh, Opera, Chrome, Firefox will pop up and say, hey, do you want to save these passwords? And you say yes. But the thing you want to do is to remember that all of your passwords for all of your online accounts should be different. You should be using a different passphrase for each one. So you can go through the animal, do like old McDonald's, you know, do like uh, orange chicken or uh, purple pig or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just different passphrases for all of your accounts. So that way, like Joe said, if one of your accounts gets hacked, they only get one account. They don't get everything. So passwords have to be different. And use a password manager. That's what that slide was for. And this one is for two-factor authentication. To make it simple, two-factor authentication is basically setting up your online account to say, hey, someone's logging on, is it you? And so if you say yes, then you get access to the online account. If you don't say anything or say no, then your account is locked up and no one's able to log on. So most sites, or most web-based 
sites have two-factor authentication. Facebook has it, Twitter has it, um, hopefully your bank has it. Usually your bank will do it by a symbol. I know Bank of America will have with a rooster or something to say that's your two-factor authentication. So you need to enable it on all of your accounts because everything's web-based out there. And at this point in time, you don't know what information is being leaked out there on the dark web. So that's where two-factor authentication comes into play. Enable it, please. Especially Apple users. I mean, your the iCloud accounts, people don't think about it, but they're a lot of, one of the most easiest hacked accounts because people just are real negligent as far as that password information is concerned. I have a quick question for you. I recently got hacked by Uber for a subscription. Let's get it right, hacked by Uber. So define that, what happened to your Uber account? Well, they charged my bank account a monthly fee um, and I didn't catch it because I don't check my, until I get my statement, you know, and I go through and I make sure, and, and now I check it daily. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I called Uber and they had my information. I'm like, but I've never signed up for anything. How did you get my information? So then I, then I, what'd you say? The dark web. Yeah. Well, and then I had to go to my bank and I had to put a block so they could never access my account. What happened when you went to Uber? You got to let them stay. I live in Kearney. We don't have Uber. <laughs> I'm yeah. saying if you travel. Um, well, I won't be using Uber. Well, and, and, and to be fair, it wasn't Uber that did it. No. Right. But Uber, you know, they weren't willing to give me my money back. Mm. Well, of course not. Because it looks back. like it came from yeah, you. It did. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like it came from you. They had all your info. Right. They got all your info. Yeah. I mean, they were super nice about it. You know, we're sorry that this happened, but, you know, we can't give you your money back. And I said, well, I'm going to go right to my bank and, and block that charge. So, and if but that cost If they were money. smart, they would have given you the money back. Because it could have cost them, and they're going to lose money, and they're going to get a fee for the charge back, too. So. Right. The other thing, too, that you have to think about, the scams that are going on as far as, like, credit card scams and stuff like that, credit card companies are not being as forthcoming as far as refunding information or refunding money back to credit cards if you've been scammed. I know there's a lot of elderly people that we've dealt with that have fallen for scams and the credit card company's like, well, heck, if they agree to the charges, then there's nothing much that we can do as far as giving them their money back. So you really have to be cognizant of your information that's on the web. And you also have to be cognizant too of these calls that come in because you may think that the elderly fall for them, but I mean, they're sophisticated enough, these cyber criminals that they can create stuff to make you click on something or to make you agree to something over the phone. The process is called social engineering. So basically cyber criminals overseas, because most of them are overseas, right. out of FBI, local jurisdiction, and they have large corporations that are designed to trick you out of your money. So just like we're kind of having a meeting now, somebody in, I'm just gonna say Addis Ababa, just making up a country, <laughs> that's in Saudi Arabia, by the way, is sitting in a room like we are right now, how are we gonna trick Americans out of their money? And so they think a different way that they can get people to respond to a lot of the scams and threats that are out there. So you always have to be on your wits end when you're looking, or not at your wits end, you have to be have your wits about you when you're looking at emails, when, you have, when you're getting those phone calls, because it's always something that's going to elicit response out of you. Either it's the grandparent scam, or oh my gosh, grandma, I'm stuck in London, I need some money wired, what am I gonna do? Or hey, I'm in the hospital, grandma, I need some money. Western Union to me, which I mean, obviously doesn't make any sense, but at the same time, you know, your, your emotional responses are going. So you really have to be cognizant and think about what people are asking. So back to number three, which is automatic, automatic backup for all your devices. And there's multiple ways that you can back up your stuff. Um, you can do an external hard drive. You can do what's called a NAS, which is network access storage, which in essence, you create your own personal cloud. So if you've got a company and you're like, man, I don't want to send it to the cloud, you can always get a NAS device. Uh, it's almost like a hard drive on steroids. So you can get a NAS device to back up your stuff automatically. Um, Windows, who, where are my Windows users? I love doing this. Who uses Windows? And where are my Mac users? Someone left their hand up for everything. That's me, I've got both. Yeah. But anyway, Windows 10 has a file history built into it, <coughs> so there's really no excuse for you not to have an automatic backup set up for your external hard drive. Same thing for Macintosh. You've got a time machine where you can automatically back up your stuff to an external hard drive to your Mac. But the problem is, if you have a mobile business or you have a mobile lifestyle, how often are you going to pull that external hard drive out to plug it in and back up your stuff? You're not. 
Everyone can say, oh yeah, I'm just, no, you're not. I'm not gonna do that. You get on your laptop or your device, first thing you wanna do is go to work. I'm not gonna do that. So my preference is to use cloud storage services. And there's two different types of cloud storage. You've got cloud storage services like iCloud, Dropbox, OneDrive, Google Drive. And then you have cloud backup services like Carbonite and Backflip. Now there's a difference between the two services. Now these allow you to store your stuff so that you can access it from different locations. For example, when I do presentations, I normally upload my presentation to OneDrive. I've always wanted to use this point. <laughs> so I upload it to OneDrive, and then when I get to my location, if the internet's good, I can download it and put it on my device. So I just use it for storage. I don't use it for backup. And that's the whole purpose of these services. Because the challenge is with uh, cloud storage services is that if your device gets hit with ransomware, it's gonna take that out too. And usually with free services, like what these offer, if something happens, your data's gone. They're like, hey, we told you it was free. That was part of our terms and service agreement that you didn't read, you know? So you wanna use a cloud backup service because what Carbonite and Backblaze offer that these don't offer is redundancy. Meaning you get redundant backups. So with Carbonite and Backblaze, you get 30 days worth of your cloud backups that are automatically backed up to the cloud as soon as you hook up your computer to it. Now with these services, yes, oops, I went too far. With these services, you can uh, set it to automatically move information there, <coughs> but if you get hit with ransomware, maybe a chance you get that stuff back, but it's a lot harder. And you may not notice for a few days that your stuff in OneDrive or with Dropbox has been encrypted or with Google Drive. Because Google Drive has backup and sync, which is free. You can synchronize your information with Google Drive and Google Photos from your devices to the cloud. Same thing with OneDrive. OneDrive's got automatic backup. iCloud, can't remember. I know Dropbox, it's got a synchronization process. No, you've got to update stuff to OneDrive. I don't think it's got the auto sync. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you've got to move it to Dropbox. But the problem is if you're relying on cloud storage services to back up your data and you don't have that automatic process in, what happens if you get hit with ransomware or your laptop's stolen? Your information is gone. So that's why you want an automatic process so that it's backing up on a regular basis. Now both Carbonite and Backblaze are 70 bucks a year for unlimited backup. The difference between the two services, Carbonite wants all their money up front. Backblaze lets you pay money. That's it. So you install them, you use them, backs up your data automatically. So if you run into a crunch, you can just go to tech support for these guys. They can say, hey, we can see with a ransomware or whenever you last used your backup, we'll restore the good files to you. Then you're back in business. So that's just my take as far as cloud backup is concerned. Use something that's automatic. Use something that's going to always back up your data so that you'll always have protection. And as far as your devices are concerned, if you're an Android user, if you're an iPhone user, pretty darn simple. Most people on their smartphones, they just store photos. So my recommendation would be to just use Google Photos to automatically back up your information. Because high-res photos, unlimited amount of high-res photos, and videos that automatically go to your Google account. Pretty simple. Android users? No one uses Android? I'm an iPhone user. Where are my iPhone users? Yeah? So I take everyone here who's using Apple, iCloud, backup. You got to stuck your hand up. Apple? Okay. Get off the beach, man. I, I am because mine says your device is not backed up because I have too much space. It's probably photos. So what you could do is download Google Photos, upload those photos to the cloud, and then you can delete all those photos off your phone. Please call me one. You need to do that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need to do that. It's pretty simple. But Android users, the Google backup services are already built in. Apple, Apple obviously wants you to use iCloud backup. Um, but you don't have to. If it's mainly photos, you can go with Google, because I'm sure everyone in here has a Google account anyway. I will take advantage of it. So number four, make sure your mobile devices are protected. Uh, obviously, we're a mobile society. We want to make sure that our devices are protected, because imagine what would happen if someone got a hold of your smartphone. They'd have access to all your data, right? Bank accounts, social media. And as a prank, I used to admit this. I said, obviously, this is with customers that I knew. If they left their social media account open, I would go on and put some like funny posts. Because they would just leave it open, you know? There was one lady, 
and she was kind of vain about herself. So we uploaded a photo of his piggy to her social media account and said, what do you think of our, my new photo? And she's like, oh my God, Samantha loved it. But then we deleted it out. But I mean, just think of things like that that could happen if someone gets a hold of your device and get access to all your stuff. Not necessarily just upload photos of Miss Piggy to their account. And Samantha was very thin, by the way. It wasn't like she was overweight. I want to clarify that. Yes, she's a 6'1 model. So that's why we chose Miss Piggy to upload. So anyway, uh, one of the best things you should do with your data when you're mobile is to encrypt your data. And it's pretty darn simple to do. If you've got a phone, it's just a matter of putting a password on your phone and your data is automatically encrypted. That simple. If you lose your phone, you got a password on it, someone gets it, they get a shiny new phone, but they're not gonna get your data. Now for a computer, it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, if you've got Windows 10 Professional on your computer, you can enable BitLocker. BitLocker's free in Windows 10 Professional. Not home, but professional. And for Mac users, you can download Solvable, which allows you to encrypt all your data on your Mac. And encryption, basically to kind of give you an idea what encryption is. So how many of you are forced to do the 5,000 piece puzzle when you go to visit your relatives over the holidays? I am, it sucks. So if, when your data is encrypted, it's basically that 5,000 piece puzzle is not put together. Encryption scrambles up your data, so no one can act, get access to it. So that's why encryption is good. So you should do it on all your devices. Uh, number five, did anyone connect to the Wi-Fi wi uh, wi to the library here? Why not? Last time I used it was horrible. I had it earlier. Oh. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, public networks, I'm not going to say that it's like leaving the barn door open, but you put your data at great risk when you use public Wi-Fi. Not necessarily at the library. Because I don't think libraries are hacker central, do you? <laughs> well, you're not gonna have some hacker sit at the library saying, man, I wonder if I can get grandma's recipe here. You know, I'm not gonna ask them. But if you're going into more public Wi Fi spots like Starbucks or co coffee houses that are populated or uh, airports or any other public uh, co working spaces, you, you put yourself at great risk when you connect to Wi Fi. Um, so, one of the things you wanna do, and this is enabled on almost every device is make sure that you're using a firewall. Firewall basically allows you to get out to the internet, but doesn't allow hackers to get into your devices. Uh, VPN, which stands for Virtual Private Network, creates a tunnel of information so that your information is safe in the tunnel and hackers that are trying to look at it can't see it. And my two favorite um, VPN software is Tunnel Bear, I like doing this, because people are like, what are you saying? I'm like, oh, uh, you know. <laughs> but Tunnel Bear and NordVPN, they work on all devices. Now the challenge with paid VPN is that you do have to pay a monthly fee to protect your information with a VPN. So you get so many bits of, or so many amounts of data that you can use through the VPN per month. So you just pay the fee to either Tunnel Bear or the Nord. I can't think of a good thing for Nord. I guess I could put a Viking hat on there. <laughs> but anyway, both of them are good and they work on all devices. Now, there's free VPN software out there and believe it or not, it's embedded in your browser. So if you use Opera, which I'm sure no one in here uses, or you use Firefox, those have VPN software built into it, which is free. Now the difference between say a Tunnel Bear, I'm going the wrong way. Difference between Tunnel Bear and Nord <coughs> and your browser-based VPN is that if you're doing something web-based, like if you're going to your bank, if you're looking on social media, you can utilize Opera or Firefox to make sure that your data is nice, safe, and encrypted. But if you're using a desktop piece of software, like say Outlook or Word, and you're transmitting data back and forth, that's when you want to settle with Nord or with TunnelBear. But the VPN and Opera, which I would highly recommend as a web browser, no one knows about it, but it's probably as fast as Google Chrome. The advantage that Opera has, it's got a VPN built into it. If you want to be safe and secure, download Opera, and turn on the VPN. The good thing about the VPN for both Nord, Tuttlebear, and with Opera and Firefox, you can even mask what part of the world you're in. So I think by default, Opera is set to over in Europe. But you have to be careful with that because if you start to go to popular websites, it'll start showing up in different languages. So then you've got to switch back to say that I'm in the US and mask my VPN. 
So, but those are some really good options if you have to use a public Wi-Fi network out there. Now, obviously the most secure way to utilize the internet when you're out in public is to use a Wi-Fi <coughs> hotspot. Now, Wi-Fi hotspot can either be on your phone, you can buy a Wi-Fi router, which is what that is, which allows you to connect up to 10 devices. But with cellular data and staying protected, when you connect with a Wi-Fi hotspot, there's only a two-way connection between your device and the cellular network company. So if someone wanted to get access to your information, they would have to hack into the cellular network, which ain't happening. No one's hacking into Sprint or Verizon or T-Mobile, AT&T. This ain't happening. I mean, maybe one day, but I mean, it's not gonna instantly happen. It's not like you accidentally connecting to someone's public Wi-Fi when you're out and about at the library or at Starbucks. So if you wanted the ultimate protection, get a hotspot. So uh, number six, finally, keep your software and devices up to date because no one wants to download updates, right? Sometimes they'll download them for you. If you're, I've had that happen during a presentation, I was ready to present, Windows update came on, took up the majority of my presentation. Luckily I made my stuff, right? <laughs> so yeah, the horrible software update, we've all seen it, no one wants to do it. You've got to do it. There's a reason why. So all the software and hardware companies have put out what's called a bug bounty on all of the exploits that could be occurring within their software. So what happens with the bug bounty to the hacker community, say Microsoft or Apple, or whoever will say, hey, we'll give you a certain amount of money if you can break into this device and we can verify it. So the hacker community tries to infiltrate your versions of Windows or Mac or your phone and see if they can do it. And if they're able to do it, and the company is able to verify it, the hacker gets a bug bounty, and you get the reward in the form of a security update. So that's why it's important to download those security updates and update your software as they come through. Because it's not like it's always a bug fix, which most people think, well, I haven't encountered this bug, so I'm not gonna update my stuff. It's more about, well, heck, there is an actual legitimate threat that could occur, that could occur. So you need to update your stuff. It's kind of like the whole FBI coming out with the whole smart TV thing. Everyone here read about that last week? Your smart TV can be susceptible to hackers that can get into your webcam and do all sorts of malicious stuff. It's one of those scenarios where it could happen. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's actually gonna happen, right? You know, because most people with their smart TVs don't have cameras mounted on them. So that scenario could happen. Same thing with your devices. It could happen, so it's better to be safe than to be sorry. So you should always update it. Um, you wanna get rid of your old devices too. I mean, if you're using some ancient Windows computer or Mac or using some old smartphone or tablet, you wanna get rid of it in 2020. Because Windows 10 is, or Windows 7 is going the way of the Dodo next year, uh, January 20th. It's done, done for. We gotta go to 10. Ten. Sorry, I don't wanna, hopefully you're not gonna touch this. What? But if there's a hard drive in there that's got your data and you didn't encrypt it, then you get rid of that old device. Mm. Did I cut you off on something you were gonna say? No, go ahead, Joe. I wasn't, no, seriously. Oh, so there's, you, you wanna contact an actual electronic recycling place that's legitimate that can make sure the hard drives are shredded and make sure that the rest of the stuff's disposed in such a way that's environmentally friendly as well. And the second one's optional, but right. the first one you should definitely do. So Macintosh, you upgrade to, are you locked in? I'm locked in. Uh-oh. Joe, are there any local um, places like that inside you? make sure that... There's several uh, recycling companies in the Kansas City area. Um, I have used a couple, and I can tell you that there's different levels of those recycling companies, too. I actually visited one and found out that all the server equipment that we've been giving them to recycle were sitting on pallets outside, and they were stripping them for parts to sell the stuff on eBay, and they advertised themselves as a legitimate company. So um, we uh, talking about surplus six uh, No, but I have heard that about them as well. But uh, so yeah, there are definitely, you wanna ask them, what do they do with the equipment? Where does the equipment go? And then a real reputable one will charge you, but you can get a certified letter of destruction on your hard drives, which is what we do for all the servers that we destroy through the data center. Or you can take a drill to your hard drive or just take a hammer and just beat crap. Yep. That sounds fun. Yeah. All yeah. right, so next Wednesday, I have a chamber office. You all bring anything you want to, and we're beating the shit out of the way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 shoot it, yeah, you can shoot it. Yeah.
So Catalina is the latest version of Mac OS. Um, get it, because it's got a lot of security features built into Catalina. Windows users, unfortunately, if you're still using 7, it's time to go to 10. Like I said before, Windows 7 is going the way of the dodo, so you've got to update to 10 to make sure that you're getting the latest and greatest security updates for your stuff. Uh, if you've got software, like uh, older versions of software, and you can update it, please do. If you use a Microsoft Office, I can tell you this, it's probably best for you to go to Office 365 as far as using an Office product rather than sticking with your old version of Microsoft Office. Now it's true that you can use Microsoft Office 97 in Windows 10, but if you're sharing documents back and forth, it's best just to go with 365, and you get the bonus of getting one, giving one terabyte of uh, free storage with OneDrive, so it's a bonus. Um, as far as antivirus software, this is where me and Joe are probably gonna be fighting outside. Uh, if you got a Mac, Mac's got Expertech built into it, uh, there's no need to download any of that obnoxious antivirus software because it's built into your Mac. It's been built into your Mac since, oh, at least since El Capitan. So don't download anything on your Mac. Same thing for Windows users. <laughs> Are you serious? Oh my gosh, he agrees. All right. I, I love saying this. And I have IT guys and tech people coming up to me afterwards. We're out fighting in the parking lot because I'm talking about antivirus software. If you've got Norton, if you've got Kaspersky, if you've got uh, AVG, if you've got a VAS, take that crap off of your computers and go with Windows 10, or Windows 10 Windows Defender. Actually, Windows Defender is built into Windows since Windows 7. It used to suck, but now Microsoft got the act together. It's even got ransomware protection built into it. So any of that stuff that you have installed, even malware, take it off. Use Windows Defender. It's free, it's included, and it will work in the background and keep all your stuff safe and secure. You only want one. So you might think, well, I got two, I might as well keep it, but. Dude, I love you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love this guy. He is absolutely right. There are some IT guys, I had one that was working for me, I had to fire because he insisted on using Windows Defender and Malwarebytes, and he charged one of our customers who had Bitdefender extra Malwarebyte protection. You don't need multiple software protecting your system. You just need one antivirus protection on your computer. And Windows Defender is it for Windows computers. And for Mac, you don't need anything at all. Because in the end, it's like I said before, user interaction. We've had customers get ransomware from all of the above. As long as you educate yourself and understand what to click on and what not to click on, you can keep your devices safe and secure. And stupid me in my presentation, I forgot to mention Google has a utility that will teach you how to learn the difference between phishing emails, fake ones, and legitimate ones. Legitimate ones. Just Google the Google email phishing test. And it will get, take you to a web-based utility that will allow you to learn the difference between phishing emails and regular emails. Now, we'll ask for your email address, but it'll even state Hey, you can get think of a fake email address. Our goal is to teach you how not to fall for a phishing scheme. And I will admit this, I've taken that test and I have fallen for some of the phishing scams that they had on there. So it's a really good utility that you can use for yourself. And if you've got employees, you can use it for them as well to help educate them about all the phishing emails out there. Because once again, when it comes to cyber security protection, it boils down to you as far as keeping yourself safe. I would uh, say that's the biggest thing going on right now, Richard, is the phishing. It's getting terrible. I've got an email from probably everybody in this room that we've all been phished, and you don't even know it. And if you've got, they're now spoofing the government agencies and the uh, the local organizations, so it'll look like it comes from Commissioner City or some different chamber, and it won't have come from them at all. Yep. Right. That is true. Your smartphones, you want to keep those up to date too. Your Android. Pi is the latest version of Android OS, Windows, or Mac users, or iPhone users, iPhone 13. And then finally, when it comes to cybersecurity, ask for help. A lot of times people will just see something and assume that it's, I got hacked, or, you know, something bad happened. So let's say, <coughs> you know, it's like, oh, they see something, you just react. You really can't do that. You really cannot just react to what's going out there as far as cybersecurity. Um, one of the sites I recommend would be Snopes. 
see someone passing around something on Facebook or social media that doesn't quite sound right, go to Snopes. They'll let you know for sure if it's a legitimate scam or not. And then finally, find your neighbor's favorite nerd. You know, and just ask them, ask myself, ask Joe, say, hey, is this, is this true? I mean, obviously, Joe and I don't dress like that, but I mean, that's kind of a good picture, right? But yeah, just ask and say, hey, you know, is this legitimate or not? Because it's all about protecting yourself and making sure that you're so safe as individuals and safe as businesses. So again, I express, learn or get the information that you need to know as far as keeping yourself safe. Make sure that your information is not floating around on the dark web by seeing if you've been pwned or going to fighting identity crime. Always ask for help, use secure passwords, and just stay safe. And don't use a ton of antivirus stuff on your computer. So. But that's it, that's me. So uh, any questions, comments? Sit down, talk, Got it. Yes. So uh, Natalie, have you got more information? So I know I have, I have old email addresses that I don't even remember having anymore. What do we do if we are sending out, because I know like my mom's email will send me stuff all the time, but it's not her. What do we do to stop that from making <coughs> like we're sending things to people? How do we fix that if that happens? See, the challenge is with web-based emails, if you're talking about old AOL accounts and old Yahoo accounts, I mean, those accounts are like always active. So I mean, the only thing you can really do is to, I guess you could try to Google that old, I mean, you said you don't remember these emails, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a challenge because you really can't shut down those accounts. You know, the only thing you can do is someone writes you back and says, hey, I got this email from you. Just let them, hey, I'm not using that email address anymore. So they keep those email addresses active. And what hackers can do, even though you may have shut that email address down, especially with a web-based account, if it's on the dark web, they can spoof that email address and send it out to your list of family and friends. Especially if it's like part of the old Yahoo breach, because that was like a billion plus yeah, email thing they had. That's not even technically then from that email account, it just looks like it is. That's right. So they just what I'm it. getting here at the chamber office is it will say Raymond Waller at iCloud at Yahoo.com. And that's what you have to work look at is to make sure there's not two, and I don't know the right word for that at all, but there's not two apps in the email before you ever open it. Um, I know that um, another tech person here in town is pretty insistent on us using Bitdefender. I don't know if you come from the that are using it because Bitdefender is supposed to stop those if you open it, I think that's what it is. Yeah. No, exactly. <laughs> but I have no idea what it does. But that's what it looks like, is that there's gonna be two at signs in the email that I'm receiving, and yes, I have got one from Waller at iCloud. That would be called, that's still spooky. <laughs> Even though it's got the two at signs, it's still spooky too. Yes. But Bitdefender, as far as email is concerned, if you have an account like Outlook, Bitdefender can scan that software program that's installed on your computer. Web-based, only bit defender can get access to that. And, and if your organization is having problems with people spoofing your, your stuff, you should call your uh, mail, whoever administers the mail server, because there are changes they can make. Like the chamber was having that issue and we went in and set it up so that only emails allowed to come from our server with their name in it. That doesn't mean the hacker's not gonna spoof and they're not gonna do it, but it's gonna get seen as uh, being spam and go to the spam folder much more likely than going straight to someone's inbox. So and stuff like that. I've worked for two separate government agencies, one the city of Richmond, the other Los Angeles County, who experienced that whole spoofing mm -hmm. scenario, um, and they were asking for money and a, and a lot of different things and money to click on stuff. So, two different IT uh, consultants for like two different jobs, and neither one of them were able to, even through the server, were able to completely stop it. So One of the things that organizations can do is just take the emails off your website. And we have done that. Yes, but I mean, once they've been exposed, it's there's nothing late. that you can do about it. So it, it can be. Is there? No, there's no way to actually stop it I, completely. I, I can send an email right now from my phone and have it come from any person's email address I want. I can spoof the the president's email address if I wanted to. I can literally make it say whatever I want, and it will get delivered to that other person's mail server. So the question then is, on that other side, is their server going to realize that's a legitimate sender or not? And every modern mail server does a check and will looks for specific records that can be put through your domain name out there that says, hey, who are actually allowed to send mail as this uh, address? 
And so your mail server administrator should be able to put in DNS records that will say, these are the only legitimate places this mail should come from. So even though I spoof that address and I get it all the way to that other person's mail server, their server should either reject it or send it to the spam folder if your mail server is set up correctly. And I can tell you right now, there's a lot of government organizations, I think Excelsior just went through this as well, that the mail servers were not set up correctly. Yeah. And they weren't being told correctly by their IT people that right. what the options were. Um, but it, it, and it, and like I said, it's not gonna stop it, but it will at least make sure that A, yours is less likely to go to the spam folder, and B, the other people who are spoofing it are more likely to go to the spam folder or get rejected. All right. And, and, and there's a place called MX Toolbox, which is a, a website you can go to that will, you can put in your domain, uh, uh, com or whatever, and it will tell you if it's set up correctly. Oh. Some of that stuff. Richmondchamber.com, or Denny's don't go to that website. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? I do have another question. Yeah. So one that I, and I know that it's not real, but I get an, an, this amazing email from someone that says they have access to my computer, that they're writing this email from internally, and they're going to share all the child porn that I have taped over the years <laughs> with all of you guys. That's called a, a sex portion scam. Yes. Basically, I know that it's not there, and, but... Right, but what happens is with the large data breaches that have occurred, usually those emails will come through with the title of I know who you are and have your password in the subject line of the email. So what happens is, as people see that, they freak out, like, true story happened to my mother-in-law, she got the sex corruption scam. So obviously she's not watching the spot that I know of, but at the same time, when she saw that password, she had used it with other accounts. And so she freaked out and was like, well, what do I do? Has my system been compromised? Whatever, I'm like, no. Just go to the bank and change your password. So she said, that's the password I use for my bank. But that's where that information is coming from, from all the large scale data breaches that have occurred. So your information's out there. You just have to make sure the hackers don't have the most current information there is about you. So email addresses, you can't necessarily change, but your passwords, you definitely want to remember all the passwords that you've used in the past. If they have been part of a data breach, you want to go through and change all those passwords. Well, with that particular thing, what they're trying to do, I, to my understanding, was install a Trojan when you click on the Bitcoin link to send them the money, but that's where the... Now, the usually in most is. cases like that, they're just trying to get you to send the money. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, that's all cyber criminals care about is the money. Yeah. So, I mean, what are they going to... I mean, it's like storage wars. People think, oh, they're trying to get into my system. They don't really care about that. They want the money. So, <laughs> as far as installing Trojans, I mean, it's like... Storage wars. If a hacker spent time or they created programs to do all that stuff, they still have to process that data to find out if they're getting into computers that have worthwhile information or not. So if it's coming from an IP that is coming from like say a residential area or like an area with small businesses, you may not take the time to even do that. So if they get the link for Bitcoin, they're just wanting the money. And I, you know, when I go through cybersecurity training, they no system can ever be secure all the way 100%, but you're doing it based on like the asset, which is the hacker's looking for some type of asset, whether it be your social security number, or your bank information, or or that type of stuff. And so the, the bigger the asset, the bigger risk you are, and the more steps you need to take to secure yourself. Right. I don't think so when anybody's trying to steal something. There you go, you can't think like that though. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but, oh, I don't. But if, yeah. if I hacked your machine, you could send emails as the chamber and it looked legitimate, then I could get people to renew their memberships with me instead of you. Yes, exactly. Right. So, <laughs> so you have an asset in your business, in your organization, in your member list. Right, yeah, so a lot of chambers need to be thinking about that because, you know, you've got assets. You've got access to data that hackers can easily make money on. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. So I would just like to say, please go back, tell your friends, tell your other chamber members, business owners in town, how much information you got from this. If 